Catholicism has a rich and turbulent history in England. From the arrival of St. Augustine of Canterbury to the great medieval English giants to the break with Rome by Henry VIII, Catholicism has played an important role in England's history. Today on Crisis Point, we'll look at the current state of Catholicism in England with a special guest. Hello, I'm Eric Sammons, your host and the editor-in-chief of Crisis Magazine. Before we get started, just want to remind people to like these videos, uh, podcasts, subscribe to it wherever you might find it, wherever you might listen to us, watch us. We do appreciate that. Also, we're on social media at Crisis Mag. So today, our special guest is Dr. Gavin Ashenden. He's a British Catholic layman. He's an author and commentator. He's associate editor of the Catholic Herald. He's formerly a priest of the Church of England and subsequently a continuing Anglican bishop. He was appointed chaplain to the Queen from 2008 until his resignation in 2017, and he was received into the Catholic Church in 2019. Welcome to the program. Eric, thank you. It's great to be here. First, I just want to ask, where are you, uh, where are you right now? Where, where, where are you living these days? Um, I'm living near my mother-in-law. That's the critical thing. <laughs> uh, so uh, my, my parents-in-law live in Shropshire. Uh, they're getting elderly. Uh, we have moved to a small house in what's called the Welsh Marches, which is the, the borderland between Wales and England, uh, directly south of, of Liverpool between Shrop, between Shrewsbury and Ludlow, for people who know the towns. And um, well, if you're half the time, I have a small house in Normandy where, with a chapel, which I'm hoping to turn into a kind of uh, ret retreat centre, essentially with the intention of be welcoming people to spend some time understanding more about St. Michael, because we're half an hour from Mont Saint-Michel, and I, I have a strong sense that in terms of the spiritual dynamics of the struggle that we're in, uh, understanding who St. Michael is and his role in the church is very important. And a half an hour the other way, there is a place where Our Lady uh, appeared in the Franco-Prussian War called Pont Main. And uh, again, I think Our Lady's appearances in, in, England, in Europe are very important. Uh, this one was particularly critical as it preceded Fatima in the First World War. And what I'm hoping to do is invite people there to consider more the role of Our Lady of St. Michael. But we, we, we're there about a third of the time because since Brexit really messed up our freedom of movement. And although although for those who know, I, am, uh, I, I voted for Brexit, I did so on the grounds of trying to preserve democracy, but I am otherwise a Europhile. And it's much, much against my own interests because I now... <laughs> You know, I ha I have to ration the days I'm allowed to spend in Europe, and and uh, that annoys me enormously. <laughs> oh my goodness, yes, I, I would guess so. So before we start talking about England, I just want you have a very interesting background, and so I just want to talk about that a little bit for our audience who might not be familiar with it. So you were a priest of the Church of England. Why did you decide become a, a priest, an Anglican priest? So the, the stepping stones of my of my adult career was that I I grew up training to be a lawyer. Uh, so I, I went to law school, and my father was a lawyer. My godparents were lawyers. My my, my two of my three children have taken law degrees. Uh, it, it's it's sort of somewhere in the water in the in the family. Um, I had an evangelical conversion uh, during my uh, time at law school, and I. Well, I, I very badly wanted to be a Christian lawyer. I think I probably still do, actually, <laughs> but it's never gone away. Um, but I, I found myself compelled to become an Anglican priest. I think I remember talking to a group of old Anglican ladies once asking about my vocation. And I said, well, I'm here under duress. And they're basically quite cross with me and say, how ungrateful. You know, you have this wonderful charism to be a priest and you're complaining. And and I, I, I did rather complain about it. I didn't want to be an Anglican clergyman, partly because... The clergy I'd met were, were uninspiring people, mm. but I but I was convinced of the reality of heaven and hell, uh, and of judgment. I'd had some strange experiences, which I talk about elsewhere, but 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 made the reality of God and judgment immensely real. Uh, and I also had a sense that England needed to be converted. No one in the 1970s knew what the next 40, 50 years were going to bring. Um, but I'm, but I'm glad that I threw my weight into trying to uh, speak out for the kingdom of heaven as much as possible. And although in the 80s and 90s it was done more as a matter of duty than anything else, by the time the noughties and and uh, and 10 to 20 came, uh, and cultural Marxism and threats to the freedom of speech began to appear, the level of the crisis that we were in in the West became apparent. A chiming particularly with some time I'd spent in the Soviet Union, where I'd been arrested 
by the KGB on a couple of occasions of Bible smuggling. I had a taste, therefore, of totalitarian Marxist culture. And and I think before before many people, I don't I don't say this as a matter of pride, but uh, my my sense of the joining the dots between cultural Marxism 2.0 and totalitarian Marxism 1.0 happened more quickly than for many is because partly because I was then teaching in a university. So I went from would-be lawyer to uh, evangelical Anglican clergyman who became increasingly Catholic. And then I spent 20, nearly 25 years as an academic leading an interfaith team in one or more radical universities. And during that period of time, I became aware of what was happening in, in culturally and, and began to be driven more and more towards the Catholic Church. As Catholicism strengthened its credentials in my eyes, whilst Anglicanism weakened um, mm -hmm. till the point came when uh, I could do nothing but move from one to the other. Right. Now, you, be, you, became, you did become a bishop. Uh, it was Wikipedia calls it a continuing Anglican bishop, and I, I looked it up a little bit. And I will admit it's a bit confusing. And so <laughs> yes. you became a bishop, was it 2013, was it, that you became a bishop? You, well, it's, it's, slightly, it's slightly embarrassing. I wouldn't, I, you know, I, I'd quite like to rewrite my history to make it look a bit more grown <laughs> wouldn't up. Wouldn't we all, though? Wouldn't we all? <laughs> Um, I mean, essentially what happened in, in 2013, I got a letter from some American bishops saying, we think the Church of England is going down the pan and we think you think it too. And we have a scheme for re-evangelizing England. And the great, the reason why you want to hear from us is we have Catholic orders. Uh, they derive from a Bishop Duarte Costa from Brazil. And uh, we know also that you're Catholic, theologically Anglo-Catholic. And we can see a time when our our reinvigorated authentic Anglicanism could find common cause with Roman Catholicism. And because our orders are Catholic, we might be able to, to, to create some ecumenical bridge in a way the Church of England can't, having had its orders declared null and void. So we want to appoint three, three uh, Anglo-Catholic bishops whose orders are authentic for the purpose of re-evangelizing England. And we, we, would you be up for it? So I said, no, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> why, why would I do such a stupid thing? <laughs> um, and, but in discussing it with my family, uh, my family were more acerbic, and they said, well, why are you turning them down? I said, well, because I, you know, I've got a reputation of making good judgments. I haven't made many professional mistakes. This would just be horrendous. Um, it, it, behind the scenes, I'd had the door closed to me uh, in terms of Anglican preferment. I'd become increasingly orthodox at a time when the church was becoming increasingly progressive and it, and whether i would have been appointed on merit or not i was certainly having doors closed on the basis of 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 belief um so you know i was aware that people would say because he can't get appointed a proper bishop in the church of england he's taken this 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 easy route and i did i frankly i didn't want anyone to say that about me um i, I would have been very offended so i told my family you know, this is a stupid thing to do. It's eccentric. Uh, it's anti-establishment. It's eccentric. Who are these people anyway? I, I'd look an idiot. I don't want to look an idiot. And my family said, well, you're putting your ego and your reputation before the kingdom of heaven. Is this such a bad strategy? And I said, well, that's actually really quite a good strategy. <laughs> I just don't want to be involved in it. Um, and so I, my, 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 they, they changed my mind. And so what I said to the, the, the Christian Episcopal Church was, I'll do this on the basis that if, if the Church of England flakes out in the way we think it is, then I will take up this role. So, um, so I will accept consecration in a separate province as, a, as an assistant bishop to, uh, to an American diocesan. Uh, and then go back almost practicing a sort of form of kenosis uh, within the, the Church of England and, and simply say discreet, rather like, um, I suppose, someone being dropped behind the enemy lines. And I hope we never have to do anything about this. Um, but but what happened? And then I was taken by surprise because um, the Anglo-Catholic movement in the Church of England had developed a scheme for living with women bishops. And it essentially said, uh, we will recognize the legal authority of the women as, the, as an ordinary, as a legal officer, as an executive officer, but we don't recognize their Episcopal orders. Hmm. So, you know, we can do as we're told in terms of administration in a diocese, but as long as we have a male bishop somewhere. And I and others had spent some time saying, this is quite a clever system. We can live with the ordination, consecration of women as bishops like this. 
Uh, it'll be uncomfortable, but we can retain our integrity. So all will be well. Um, I found that on the first day the Church of England consecrated a woman, Darcy and Bishop, I went to pray in my parish church and, and I was undone. I mean, I, I I had a conversation with the Lord saying, I can't go on. This is I, I thought I could. I thought I could manage the gymnastics in my head. But as from a spiritual level, it's very hard a gut reaction. I, I, I said this is this is quite impossible. This is this is such a disastrous step. This undoes everything that uh, that the Church of England ought to stand against. Um, and so I resigned my Anglican uh, living, my, my, my role as a vicar on the island of Jersey. And as I did so, I spoke to the, to the, the man who was my bishop and said, uh, I'm going to take on a role in an American church. Is there any way we can manage this process amicably? I'd like to tell you what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. And I think we should be polite to one another. I did, um, and <laughs> I basically got the message, we will hound you. We will hound you every every day, every minute of the day. And what's more, we've changed the canons. So that if you make a single error, we will bring a disciplinary measure against you. If you use the wrong liturgy, we'll, we'll do everything we can to bring you down. Right. So I was surprised at this, but... Um, uh, and there is, in fact, a mechanism for divesting yourself of Anglican canonical responsibility. It's, it's called, um, oh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a Victorian Act from in the 19, uh, brought in the 19, in the eighteen seventies. Um, and so, in order to stop them doing that, I, I divested myself of my Anglican priestly orders. Uh, uh, it, it's, it, it was mainly brought in. The capacity to pursue errant clergymen was mainly brought in to catch covert paedophiles, and in that sense, it was a very good idea. Right. Um, but it had, but it had the unlooked for, unforeseen consequences of making anyone who'd ever been ordained perpetually uh, liable to canon law. So, um, so I resigned my orders, and then I took up this role uh, as as a missionary bishop. There were about five or six. Uh, Orthodox Anglican groups in England who were nothing to do with the Church of England, ranging from the evangelical to the very Catholic. Okay. Um, and it did seem to me to be a, a worthwhile project to try and draw these disparate groups together to see if a form of Orthodox Anglicanism could be uh, fused together. And two things happened to make it impossible. One is I, I, be, I became increasingly moved and impacted by the Eucharistic miracles, beginning with the one in Buenos Aires in 94, which is so, so scientifically stunning that that it really ought to, <laughs> it answers <laughs> a thousand years of sacramental argumentation <laughs> and, 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 and particularly, you know, the, the, the anarchy of the last 500 years from, from Zwingli and Calvin onwards. Um, and I'd also become increasingly emotionally and theologically taken with Our Lady's apparitions. Um, and so the combination of uh, uh, a, a pull to be truly and properly Catholic, uh, alongside the fact that as I tried to negotiate with the other Anglican groups who were part of this project, I saw two things. First of all, that, that it was going to be very difficult to persuade people to be Anglican outside the establishment. There is no history whatsoever in England of people being conceptually or theologically Anglican. It's a tribal and a cultural identity. Right. And therefore, there's no way in which one would move from a tribal cultural allegiance to a dogmatic allegiance, which is what a, 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 um, a sort of a renewed alternative Anglicanism called for. Uh, it partly, it partly people are too lazy and comfortable and they've just never thought about it. But, but the other thing was, of course, there was, the, I realized very quickly, we couldn't agree, all of us, on absolutely essential elements of ecclesiology, sacramental life, uh, discipline, because there was no magisterium. And so as we had various uh, events, I mean, I'm one, of, one of the bishops, for example, one of the uh, was quite content to live within two jurisdictions where the Canadians he worked with ordained women as priests and bishops and the Americans he worked with didn't. So I said to him, well, 
how, how do you, I mean, tell me, how, how do you even begin to find some level of theological ecclesial integrity? What are you doing if you're, you know, apart from just right. being pragmatically evasive? Uh, and there was no answer at all. And I, I, I'm afraid I found, how do I say this politely? But I mean, I found it difficult to be anything other than contemptuous of something that appeared to me to be so ideologically vacuous, uh, being sold out to, to, to pragmatism. But in one sense, the same arguments applied to me in a rather less intense way. Um, I was unable to find a, a coherent set of theological principles to bind together the Anglican colleagues I was with. So in one sense, I was in not in a not very different position. And during this period of time, I realized that the experiment I'd embarked on four or five years was not without the magisterium was not going to work. This is why the, the Catholics have the, the catechism and the magisterium is precisely why. And, and there was a point at which I thought, okay, there's, there's no, there really is no alternative to being a Catholic. And it was about then my local Catholic bishop said, we think you're Catholic. We'd like you on the team. Would you come across? <laughs> Very good. One more question I want to ask about your background, though, is uh, chaplain to the queen. What exactly does that? I mean, I'm an American. I don't know what the heck. What does that mean? Uh, it's it's England's version of Disneyland. Uh, it's very pretty and it's very ornate and it means nothing. OK, um, <laughs> so uh, so you're not it, advising the queen or anything on her spiritual life or anything like that by being chaplain I'm, to the queen. I'm really well. So the answer is. 90% no and 10% yes. Okay. Um, 90% no, because the whole thing is a charade. Like so many Anglican and English things, it, it's, you know, it, it's just, it's, it's essentially pretense. Uh, it, it's a wonderful old idea that ran out of reality, but is kept for cosmetic reasons. So as a Catholic idea, it worked extremely well. The king needed a bunch of chaplains a priest to go around with him to celebrate mass. So when Henry V went to invade France, he would want to take a bunch of priests to celebrate mass as they went. Uh, and as the as the as the royal family, as as a head of state moved around, mass was celebrated. As a Catholic idea, it's great. It makes a lot of sense. If you stop believing in mass uh, and you stop invading France quite so often, um, <laughs> the, 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 there may be no need to have a cohort of priests accompanying the king. Uh, so what the Protestants did is they, they turned it into a preaching shop. So there's a there's a palace in London called St. James's Palace, and all the royal chaplains would preach there once a week. But the reason the reason I'm being a bit acerbic about it was the Queen would never go there. It was the one place over the weekend that the Queen never went. <laughs> um so so the whole the whole thing was a was a charade. However, um that's the 90% of it being nonsense. The 10% of it being being uh having some some potentiality to it is that you get invited to garden parties and to to, to uh, royal events, and so you wander around in a pseudo Catholic, a pseudo cardinal's cassock, looking like a cardinal. And, and there are then opportunities to make friends within the royal family and the royal household, ladies in waiting, ambassadors, junior members of the, of the royal family. If they like you, they might consult you. If they consulted you, you would have to keep it completely quiet because otherwise you would destroy the basis on which the relationships right. took place. Um, so there was some scope for that. Uh, when I was asked, there might be more scope than I think. When I was asked to resign by the, um, by, by the, by the man who, ran, who runs the, the royal palaces, uh, the Lord Chamberlain, uh, I, had been, I had been becoming increasingly vocal about Islam in the public space mm -hmm. for some very good reasons. And, and I'm, I'm reasonably competently theologically educated in terms of Islamic theology and Islamic history. I had taught a course at the university I lectured at, uh, amongst other things. Um, but I, uh, I I was phoned up and <laughs> Lord Chamberlain said, and I, I mean, this is, this is English um, diplomatic speak of a high quality. So he said, um, Dr. Ashenden, we, we're, we're entirely agreed the Queen can't possibly be involved in, in any contemporary political issues or else she loses her role. So the problem we have is that there is a public perception that when you say something in public, um, uh, there is a perception that the, the Queen might agree with you. Um, and the difficulty we have is she might. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there's another problem we have is that when you speak in public, there's a public perception that the Queen might be advised by your views. 
And the difficulty we have with that is she might be. <laughs> can, can you help me solve the problem? Right. And I said, well, there are, there are only two answers. One is I, 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 I become silent. And the other is I resign. Right. Well, how perceptive of you, he said. <laughs> 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 that, made, that made decision pretty clear. Um, and, and actually, you know, just that made me think like just, you know, we Americans, we have a difficult time with the whole monarchy, things like that. But we're Catholic as well, Catholic Americans. And so monarchies in our blood in another sense as well. Sure. And so in English Catholic, obviously, Queen Elizabeth is your monarch. And, you know, I, I, I'm actually a big fan of Queen Elizabeth in a lot of ways, but yet she's also the successor of Henry VIII, and she's the head of the Anglican Church in some way. How does a Catholic then kind of reconcile all that in their head, in their attitude toward, how do they look then towards the Queen? I think with very real difficulty. One of the things I did on becoming a Catholic was to reread my Reformation history. Uh, so, so let me correct you for a moment to say she's not really... Henry VIII's successor. I mean, Henry VIII was the last Catholic monarch, and he was followed right. by Edward VI. So she, uh, but Edward VI was a boy child who was um, had Protestant advisors. He was followed by Mary. Mary was followed by Elizabeth. She's really Elizabeth's successor. Right. Uh, and the problem is, as you read Elizabethan history, you discover that for um, for fifty or sixty years, the state set out to execute Catholics in the most brutal and repressive way and to accompany it with a level of, of deceptive propaganda that was profoundly offensive. So as one, one rereads the history of the 16th century, as a Catholic, one gets deeply moved. And, and you say to yourself, who, who are these agents of an anti-Catholic state? To what they, they begin to lose political, well, not political, they begin to lose metaphysical and philosophical integrity and become apparatchiks of a repressive state. And then as one goes through the, you know, through the 19th century, this, this deep, profound, and I would say satanic uh, antagonism to the Catholic Church is profoundly embedded in the Anglican establishment and particularly in the person of the monarch. This only begins to change with the Catholic Emancipation Acts, um, but still it's ludicrous. Uh, there's, no, there's no bar against... Uh, a, a royal heir marrying a Muslim, but there's absolutely a bar against him marrying a Catholic. So this anti-Catholicism is is written into the whole English system, and I think this makes life very difficult for Catholics. Um, I came to it sufficiently late in the day for it to become present itself to me as a as an aberration. But I think if I'd grown up with it, I would I would feel somewhat neutered. Uh, I, I would feel that I was an Englishman on license. Um, so long, you know, required to keep my Catholicism quiescent, because the establishment was was completely set against it. I, I, at my age, I feel entirely different. I want to call out a Protestant monarchy and say, uh, "This is a bad thing to be. <laughs> it's it's right. it's bad because you're Protestant because you're on the wrong side of history." I mean, let's take a leaf out of the Marxists at the moment. Uh, it is it is indeed possible to be on the wrong side of history. Christianity is on the right side of history. The, the people who are on the best side of history are the Catholics. <laughs> but, but, but Protestants are not on the right side of history. And the reason I say that is not as a, a matter of sort of dogmatic assertion, but because the 500-year the, the experiment that was the Protestant church has largely come undone. That's not to say that there's no virtue in Protestantism, uh, and, and I'm particularly fond of Pentecostalism. But, but in terms of state Protestant churches that Europe was made up out of, and uh, they... they uh, their, their time is over. They have they have no they have no currency, and the denominations are failing fast. Anglicanism will be defunct in this country within five to ten years. Uh, it's yeah, the average age of people is almost seventy, uh, and the church has gone completely woke. It's lost its raison d'être. So, um, so I think it's very difficult, and that's one of the reasons I think why it's taking some time for Catholics, and particularly the Catholic episcopate to gain a sense of momentum and perhaps fueled by a prophetic awareness of what God may be calling them to be. Effectively, if the Catholic Church does not step into the secular gap that the death of the Church of England has, uh, has created, along with the vacuum of Christendom, there will be no Christianity. Only the Catholic Church can do it. But at the moment, it seems to me 
that those people who've been cradle Catholics have been neutered by, first of all, a great deal of class snobbery. You weren't, you know, Catholics were, were Irish and Italians, unless you were the Duke of Norfolk. <laughs> He's the only exception, <laughs> uh, effectively speaking. And um, uh, and and outsiders only only recently allowed into Oxford and Cambridge, uh, always slightly suspicious because of the propaganda of uh, of, of uh, the Elizabethan state with the Armada and our and our xenophobic mistrust of the French and the Spanish. There are a whole series of reasons for being anti-Catholic in England, and and the rational the rational um, I was going to say reasons, that's tautological. The rationality behind them has long evacuated, but the emotional and cultural prejudice remains. And I think I'd like to see the Catholic Church um, uh, encouraged by, by latecomers like me uh, pick up its responsibilities and say, you know, it's us or nothing, so let's let it be us. Right. So in so England, I mean, here in America, we've had just cultural defeat after cultural defeat. Uh, things going in the wrong direction. But every once in a while we have a victory. Like we had the Dobbs decision where Roe v. Wade was overturned and that was a great victory here. It seems to me from the perception over here is that the England is actually, it's, it's even worse, that the, the cultural defeats are even greater over there. Is that accurate? Is it basically just becoming more and more woke, more and more anti-Christian over, over there? Yes, I'm very sorry to say that it is. Uh, I wish I could say that it wasn't, but I think only by recognizing the reality can we uh, engage in some kind of fight back or some kind of, we need a strategy for dealing with life as it really is. Uh, and um, in terms of, of uh, the process of secularization, England is right at the cutting edge. Um, so uh, the, the Church of England had to decide whether or not it went for a, a kind of uh, popular affirmation at the hands of the newly secularized culture and decided it would do that, uh, failing completely to recognize that you cannot be secular and Christian at the same time, any more than you can be woke and Christian at the same time. Be because the whole the whole thought system that, that lies behind secularism and wokery is articulately anti-Christian. It's, it's almost like it's that's what it's designed to attack. Um, so, but Catholicism remains quiescent to some extent. I mean, we, it could be quite useful. We have a, a, a fairly famous Catholic politician called Jacob Rees-Mogg, and when he's attacked on his views on abortion, for example, or homosexuality, he, ra he rather delicately and lackadaisically lifts his hands into the air and says, you know, please, please don't attack me. These, uh, these are the views of my church. <laughs> Take it up with my church, if you like. But you know, I'm I'm simply a quiet, faithful Catholic. I, if I'm a Catholic, I have no choice. And this this completely throws the interviewers, and they go looking for another chink in his armor. They haven't got time to work this one through. But to some extent, um, that allows Catholics a a degree of public protection that Protestants don't have because they uh, have to make their own individual choices. But but what can the Catholic Church do now? That's uh, well, to my mind, I think I, I think Rodrea has it right when he says that we've long lost the battles. I mean, we've lost them so badly that that the judges and senior policemen are now hugely woke and, and anti-Christian. Uh, it's got right to the top of the of the age tree. I mean, you you might really only expect people over sixty to be slightly untouched by the propaganda. Anyone under sixty. Is, is is brainwashed into it in the most extraordinary way. So what can the Catholic Church do? I think we have to go back to the catacombs. Uh, I think we have to have voluntary societies. I think there are some things we can preach about in public, in the public space, and other things we have to talk about amongst consenting adults who are catechumens. Um, and, and if you can't tell the difference, you'll go to prison because you'll be accused of hate crimes. So... You said that the Anglican the Church of England is going to be defunct. It's basically just dying. Uh, I mean, the numbers are not good over here for the Catholic Church either. I mean, they're not good for any of the traditionally Christian uh, churches, religions. Um, what is then the state of the Catholic Church there as far as are, are the bishops leading against the woke? Are they kind of are they giving into it as well? Are there priests that are speaking up, lay people? I mean, are, are parishes, are, is it growing? Is it dying? What, what, what's going on there? Well, first of all, the, the, the numbers who go to Mass are between two and four times greater than, than Anglicans. 
I mean, I think the Anglicans are are about four. I mean, they claim seven or eight hundred thousand uh, uh, at mass a week, but I think they're more like three or four. In fact, um, they they do this by having um, uh, uh, toddler clubs and and, uh, and and old people's lunches, and then they 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 say here are our members, but um, it's entirely disingenuous. Uh, because the Catholic Church here has been hugely helped by by immigration, so. Uh, a lot of the people who are Catholics in England were, are not indigenously English, but you know that doesn't matter. They're still they're Catholics and they're here. Where do they come from? Like what country? Um, uh, there was a there was a large influx from from Europe, uh, okay. mainly Poland, okay. um, but uh, but but far wider than that as well. Um, the 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 English Catholic bishops appear to. Uh, they appear to be making discretion their primary value, um, and I think they're slightly in awe of the of the Anglican establishment still, which if they had known it as well as I'd known it would pass immediately, but but <laughs> nonetheless they they appear to be. Um, so the numbers aren't aren't that bad. I mean they're not good, but they're not bad. Um, but they're not they're not as atrocious as the Church of England. I, I I can't tell what's going to happen in the future, but effectively. And this is the big crisis in the Catholic Church. Um, there are two ways of being a Christian today. One is progressive and secular, and the other is increasingly. Uh, well, so I, I don't want to use the word traditional. That's that's unhelpful. Um, I, I would say the other would be uh, expressed by a form of cultural allegiance that stretches across the millennia. Uh, so you know, a, a kind of Catholic who who didn't define themselves by what's happened in the last 200 years in the West. Um, and that Catholicism is going to, uh, is going to flourish I increasingly as, as people often find their way to God through breakdown. And we have a great deal of breakdown at the moment. The, 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 there's a lot of mental breakdown. Levels of mental illness are stratospherically high. Uh, there's a great deal of, of there's, a, there's an emergence of the occult again. Uh, it's the old Chestertonian thing. It's not, when they stop believing in God, they don't become atheists. They believe in anything. Um, and so we have a great opportunity as Catholics to be able to bring the whole weight of Catholic experience to broken people with a broken society, with broken morality uh, and, 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 a, and, a, and a broken sanity and say to them, you can be saved. Um, in one sense, it's as things get get worse that evangelism becomes most most potent and most articulated. Um, so it's quite painful. It's, it's going to be very difficult, but uh, secular Catholics will find themselves absor absorbed into the, into the unbelieving, impotent mass. And um, authentic Orthodox Catholics will be, find themselves reinvigorated, if for no other reason than, than being, you know, the glory of God as a human being fully alive. And to be, to be a Catholic is to be, to be given all the graces you need to flourish. And the distinction between people who have that and those who don't have it will grow ever more marked. Yeah, I feel like it's similar to what I've been saying over here about it's not necessarily that. I mean, the church, I think the numbers are going to continue to go down in the Catholic Church over here in America because those who are just accepting of the culture and kind of go along with it and try to also be a little Catholic, that does not pass on. That does not pass yeah. on to the next generation. It, just, it dies out. And those who are, I, I know, I understand your hesitation. You use the word traditional because that has certain connotations as well. But just basically, as you said, kind of accepting uh, the, the totality of Catholicism, I guess, um, that they, they, those people have the ability to resist the, the culture. It, it just seems to me, though, that the, the, the higher ups in the church seem to be against those who are accepting the totality of Catholicism. And we, we see that here with a number of bishops that seem to be most upset by people like that, rather than trying to say, hey, let's, let's all grab onto this. Is that also the case over, um, over in England? Yeah, yes, it is. And I have some direct experience of it. I, I, I spent two years doing postgraduate work with the Jesuits at part of the University of London in the 1980s. So I, and I liked the Jesuits very much. They were, they were ideal for, a, for, for my kind of Anglican. Uh, we, got a, we, we were indistinguishable. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
And so I, I think I understand the kind of language that Pope Francis is using and that, that many of the bishops are using. They, and it's a particular mindset that originates from the 40s, 50s and 60s. And uh, it, it, it bought in, I think essentially it's bought into the idea of progress. And, and it bought in so, so strongly into the idea of progress uh, and placed a lot of its confidence in the possibility of a marriage between political activism and, and liberal progress, uh, whilst at the same time being frightened and upset by the raw metaphysical high octaneness of traditional belief. Partly because the, the, the one of the great fictions of, of, of progressive intellectual life is that um, you want to avoid superstition and medievalism. Actually, my view is that the that the fifteenth century was probably the, the the absolute apex of human civilization and achievement. I mean, you know, maybe you know, maybe the seventeenth, but polyphony in architecture uh, and, and and social compassion and intellectual sophistication, and the and the launching of of the scientific revolution. I mean, it was just a moment of of, of the most extraordinarily fulfilled potential. But to go back to the point we were making, there is a kind of late 20th century view that, that anything that precedes 1850 is somehow barbaric or, or myopic or, or undereducated. And I think it's a very bad reading of history. And in itself, it's a form of brainwashing. So I, I'm afraid I think that a lot of the senior clergy, in uh, certainly universally true in Anglicanism, but also within Catholicism, uh, have bought into that, and they they haven't had a sufficient crisis of faith or intellectual uh, angst to 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 revisit the presuppositions upon which their adult life has been built. It's much easier to persecute people who frighten you than it is to revisit your original presuppositions. It's really quite a it takes a lot of courage to do that, um, and so I think I think it's a generational thing. They'll be dead in ten or fifteen years. I'm I'm fairly convinced that we've only got to see the next couple of decades out, and and, and people slightly older than me and of my age will will no longer uh, have this this asphyxiating effect as we represent the the last gasp of uh, of twentieth century rationalism. Um, but but I, that's what I think it is. Yeah, I think we. It seems to me that the path we're going on is the only people who are going to be left in the church are those who are you know, accepting of, of, of all the totality of Catholicism. Yeah. They kind of reject this progressivism. And yes, that means it will likely be very small, but I feel like that's a foundation you can build on to grow. I and mean, that's how the early church, of course, built from that small mustard seed. And you go from there. Not that we want the church to get smaller, but it just seems to be inevitable. And what, what, you know, Ratzinger, Father Ratzinger, when he was Father Ratzinger, uh, he, 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 that's his, his famous prediction wasn't like he was saying, I want it to get smaller. I think he was just saying, listen, I, I see what's happening here and it's going, and you know, he was right, it is getting smaller. But it just seems crazy to me that Catholic leaders, we actually have an example in the Anglican church of a church that embraces <laughs> modernity and what happens. So why would we want to do that? <laughs> no, no, because it takes such courage to revisit the presuppositions you've built your whole life and your success upon. I mean, again, these people were only appointed because they believed these kind of things. So to start disbelieving them in your, in your old age is really quite difficult. I mean, one of the things I've been surprised at is it, it, it takes quite a lot of effort to go on thinking as I'm growing older. I, I thought that in my late 60s, I'd, I'd develop both spiritual and intellectual muscle that would see me out to the end of my life. And I'm finding neither is true. I, the gravitational forces of entropy mean it's, it's just as hard, if not harder, to go on fighting spiritually and intellectually uh, as one grows older. And I think some of the people we're talking about, have, they either never done it or they've certainly given up. Um, but but in one sense it doesn't matter because you're you're quite right. The two voices that I uh, are, are the little lamps that point ahead into the fog of the future for me are are Ratzinger and um, Cardinal George of of Chicago. You know, he said, "I'm going to die in my bed. My successor will die in jail. His successor will be martyred, and his successor will begin to rebuild Christendom as we always have done in the cycle of human history." Uh, well, his his successor is Cupich, and he's not dying in jail. Yeah. No, he <laughs> yes. he might be the jailer. <laughs> he might be the jailer.
but um but i think i mean you know allow him to allow this to be drama and hyperbole a bit why not right it needs to catch our attention uh, i think the trajectory is right uh, the, I, I don't worry so much about the numbers in the west because the west is doomed i mean there, you know we're back to dreyer's analysis the west has gone right uh P peterson is right about this we might there might be bits of the intellectual West which can survive on the internet as we reconfigure the university project. But um, the long march of the institutions has been so deeply successful. I think we have to accept that Europe and the States has gone. And so then the question is, you know, what's happening in the rest of the world? Well, look at, look at China. Uh, and although it's highly controversial, you know, what's happened in Russia in the last 30 years, 40 years, is extraordinary. It's difficult to gauge, but it's still extraordinary. Uh, and, and everything is to fight for in Africa. So let's assume that secularism has burnt itself out in America and, and Europe. What else was it going to do? That shouldn't be a surprise to us. And, and that the secularists have done their very best to silence their major rival, Christianity. So our children have, have, have uh, been subjected to a very thorough indoctrination at the hands of the media and cinema. I mean, the, the, the lyrics of, of their music and the, the, the films they've been watching and the, 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 the torrent of sheer detritus that pours out of the TV screens. It's amazing. It's amazing the numbers of what they are. We should, we should celebrate them. <laughs> but, 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 but recognize what we're fighting. We're fighting something deeply, deeply spiritually toxic. And, um, uh, but what we must not do is to pretend that we're at the end of the first half of a match where our team hasn't done very well. You know, we're at the end of the second half, and there's going to have to be a rematch with a, with a different team on a different pitch. Yeah, I, I, a lot of people I know they're very critical of Roger Air as, and they consider him like a defeatist, and he's surrendering. And I've never seen it like that. It seems to me what he's saying is, is we've lost these major battles. So if you're in a war with somebody and you've lost all the major battles and you've your your troops have been decimated and the other side has got way more advanced weapons than you have right now how do you it's not surrender to say okay now let's go underground and build up and find ways to kind of attack them from the from this side from that side do little fates you know just little attacks here and there but ultimately what we're doing is we're trying to build up the strength behind our walls so we can then be stronger it just seems to me that that's a logical way to go about it and it's a recognition of the reality which is like you said in the West, we've lost. I mean, we have lost. And so therefore we have to regroup to fight again. Is that, I mean, is that, that seemed to be what, what you're saying in England as well, that, that has to happen? Yes, but, I, but again, I don't see it. We see when we, we, we've lost, I think what's happened is, uh, what we should say is that in the last 200 years, a form of post-Christianity has taken place. Uh, and do you know what, do you know what your, your, your dreadful, corrupt post-Christianity looks like? It, 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 it looks like the end of the 20th century when human beings killed each other on, on, on a scale that, that is absolutely appalling. I was very taken by the fact that, uh, that, that someone said that um, Obama's foreign policy caused uh, 10 times as many deaths as the Inquisition did. Uh, because if you, if you want to compare the sheer destructiveness of secular 20th century and 21st century uh, uh, politics, then, then uh, it comes off extremely badly. So... I don't take responsibility for, as a Christian for anything that happened after 1850. Uh, the, the, you know, this was a secular experiment, and it's been appalling. And so I think what we should say is, if you wanted to give up the protection that Christianity gave you uh, and, and try something else, well, you've done it. So now you can tell the difference. Choose Christ. Avoid Darwin. Avoid, uh, avoid Marx. Uh, avoid, avoid Stalin. Avoid Hitler. Uh, avoid... Uh, Disney, choose Jesus. Um, and, and we should be proud of this and say, and if you, of course, it's no surprise that for, for 200 years, the church has been ground down by re relentless propaganda. I'm, I'm writing, a, trying to write something on the, on the gay issue at the moment, and I'm, I'm rereading Freud and Foucault. Uh, and as I do so, I, I don't mean to sound pretentious, but I'm, I'm reminded of what I always knew, which was Freud's position on sexuality changed endlessly. He didn't have a fixed position. He was more of a gadfly, constantly reacting. Uh, and, and actually, late Freud becomes quite sensible, almost quite attractive. Uh, and, and Foucault, of course, also had uh, 
a series of, of of shifting positions almost by by definition, but dealt only in power. So the fact is our opponents don't have a fixed position. They are they are people who set out to react against God. They're enemies of God who sought to attack the whole the whole idea of Christendom, and they did so very effectively. We should never have given way in the way we did. It's partly our failure. But but the project of the last 200 years is not ours. It's it's our enemies. So let's, expo let's expose it for what it is and say to the people we live amongst, um, it was better in, in 1400 when, uh, when people were only able to go to war three days a week because the other days were saints' days. And the Pope <laughs> wouldn't let kings fight on, on saints' days. So... However bellicose you were, you still had 50% less aggression because of the Catholic Church. Um, so, you know, wh which system would you like to live under? We're uh, much more efficient they... with our killing today. Absolutely. You know, drones day, <laughs> drones day and night. There's no Sabbath right. for drones. <laughs> the, the idea you could be safe on a saint's day would be quite appealing to Al-Qaeda, I think. But anyway, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm, I, I feel much more confident about our capacity to take the intellectual and the cultural argument to our enemies. Uh, apart from anything else, they're terribly unhappy. <laughs> they're really screwed up and unhappy. They're not, this is not, you know, they're not living a a, a, a full life. And they've, all this nonsense that, that Jung in particular persuades us with, that you know, we're here to live to a, to maximize our potentiality. But, but there is no maximization and there appears to be very little potentiality. And we should say that the, the, the real depth of human life is discovered when the animal and the angelic are, are find, find their way into a new synthesis, which is a new birth and, and, and fueled by the Holy Spirit. And we're set free from those corrosions that, that destroy us and one another. I mean, Christianity is so appealing intellectually and emotionally and culturally and spiritually. We really should get off our backsides and begin to talk about it more in public to people who are in real trouble. And that, that is the frustration when sometimes our leaders don't don't they, they, they want to hide that. And I think you're right that it is so appealing. One um, one what I think is a bright spot, at least in the Catholic Church, uh, is the ordinariate. Um, yeah. And I, are you a member of the ordinariate when you came in? I, I'm a lay member of the ordinariate. Yes. That's what, yeah, right, right. <laughs> so I feel like that is a, um, a bright spot. I, I just uh, attended a ordinary mass for the first time in my life this past Sunday, actually. I, I'd been meaning to. There's not one too close to me. And we were out of town. And so I was like, hey, I found out there was one there. So I attended. And I've done a lot of reading. I've had interviews about it. Uh, but what's your take on the state of the ordinary specifically in, in England? I think it has huge potential. I, I heard someone say, and again, this is hyperbole, and, and, and but but I like it nonetheless. <laughs> they said that that um, the ordinary are the new Jesuits in England, um, and and I mean, in one sense, of course, they're not. But in another sense, I think what the, the critic was trying to say was, here is a group of people who uh, are moved by a, a level of conviction that is really quite unusual, uh, and a level of competence too. They they marry competence and conviction, and as it happened. Uh, they they bring with them Shakespeare, <laughs> in the in the sense that uh, the, one of the best things about Anglicanism was the formation of its liturgy in the 16th century, when English was at its most beautiful. Uh, and if you believe in beauty, and, and the Catholic Church does, then then what the ordinariate does is it, it is, is it brings in a literary and a poetic beauty to match the best of, archi of architectural Gothic beauty. Uh, and that's no small thing. In fact, one of the reasons why I asked to transfer from uh, from diocesan allegiance to the ordinaria was, uh, as I began praying the divine office more regularly, I, I I just got fed up with with the bad translations from the Hebrew and the rather lame uh, English uh, music in the meter and I thought well it's just not very good English and it's not very good Hebrew it's not very good Greek um, and my my prayers have been formed in the last 40 50 years by um, by the book of common prayer so the idea that one could take some of this very very beautiful liturgy and marry it into Catholic doctrine and dogma seems to me to be the best of both worlds and I think when you combine that 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 beauty and that depth with a, a group of people who are, who are wholly admirable in terms of their conviction and courage, then you you do have something really rather special. Does that mean that that you know who knows what will come of it? But but it has a, a 
to 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 mock my own analysis earlier on. It also it has a lot of potential, <laughs> right, right. but I mean, this is not not the potential of the developing self, but but the potential in terms of of uh, an aspect of the Catholic Church which is which is profoundly rich and can seed itself well. Do most, you might not know the answer to this, but do most Anglican converts to Catholicism there in England, do they go to the ordinariate or is it some just go diocesan, some are ordinariate or how does that work? I'm afraid there's no end to English snobbery. So my <laughs> friends have gone the diocesan route. When I say, well, why haven't you come to the ordinariate? They simply repeat the snobbery of the Catholic diocese, which is, you know, who are these people? You know, the, the diocese is the real place to be a real Catholic. What do you... Not not this stamp collector's club of an ancient liturgy. <laughs> that <laughs> so if, one could pick up snobbery very quickly if you want to be part of the crowd. But I think I think they've made a mistake to do that. Uh, and, and I mean, as it happens, I'm afraid that the, the the rank and file Catholic community in this country look at the ordinary with a degree of horror. Uh, partly because you know the whole bunch of people who have uh, who've inherited, I'll say, the deformed Vatican II spirit in order to make a distinction between the Second Vatican Council and the deformed presentation of what progressives would like it to mean. So having made that, I think, that important distinction, there are a lot of secular people who suffer from a deformed Vatican II spirit, and they don't want Anglicans who see through this joining the Catholic Church because they'd rather stay in their slightly woolly, liberal, permissive, progressive uh, atmosphere. So to that extent, the ordinariat and Anglican converts are not wholly welcome. But but I'm afraid I think that's a that, that's a fault in the perception of those who can't find it in their hearts to welcome. They don't know what the issues are. Right. Well, I, I'm, I'm glad to hear, though, that it uh, seems to be doing well there. It seems to be doing well here in the States as well. Um, I, I just think there seems to be growing a little bit. I, I know there are people who are worried, and I, I understand that that perhaps there will be some moves against the ordinary because of the moves that have happened against the traditional Latin mass. And because if you go to an area mass, a lot of the thing, because some of these, a lot of these bishops who have cracked down the traditional Latin mass, they then say, Oh, and Nova Sordo, you can't do ad orientum. You can't do it in Latin without permission. You can't do, mm -hmm. you know, we don't want uh, ultra rest of that. But of course the ordinary, not the Latin part, but the, the, they have the ad orientum, the incense, all the, and so do you think there is, is, or is there a concern do you have a concern, I should say, with the idea the ordinary might be next as far as like trying to tap it down a little bit? I, I read a very interesting article that, that I wanted to believe, <laughs> <laughs> which said that um, the ordinary is, is such an unusual creature that it doesn't easily fall into the same category of, uh, of the Latin mass, partly, and, and partly because of Vatican II. So it seems to me that the, the 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 antagonism against traditional Latin mass is mainly uh, brought about by people who have a particular reading of the Second Vatican Council. Uh, I, I think it's a poor reading of it. It's a it's a highly progressive and liberal one, and I don't think it recognizes the richness of the Second Vatican Council, as I read the documents. But but they're frightened that their pet project will be found lacking, and the people who appear to be calling it most into question are, are the Latin mass traditionalists. The ordinary act doesn't have a problem with the Second Vatican Council. It kind of bypasses it culturally and theologically. Um, and so I think that it may escape the opprobrium uh, in this Catholic civil war. Uh, it, it may not, but I hope But I hope it does. And... Um, uh, but I'm, but I'm, I also hope that the opprobrium and the civil war will only last another ten years, because I really do think, again, it's 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 being conducted by uh, by by people on the whole who are over seventy, uh, and um, uh, they'll be gone soon. Uh, I can't I can't see people under seventy continuing continuing this this internecine warfare against the roots of developing Catholic tradition. Yeah, I saw that. I, I posted this on Twitter, this great quote I saw where the Catholic Church is the only institution where men in their 70s and 80s tell people in their 20s and 30s to get with the times. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I have to not laugh here. It shakes the floor and shakes my screen. But I mean, that's, you know, these, these, these ancient, confused hippies are, are much to be pitied. Uh, but they have power at the moment and they will soon lose power. And, you know, the fact is, it's the Catholic Church. We'll see them out. Right. You know, we've, we've seen out the Aryans. We've, 
and we you know we we we've it's a, the, the tradition and the Holy Spirit and, and Petrine integrity will see these people out. That's right. Absolutely. Amen. Okay, one last question for you, and I'm going to put you on the spot here. If you were the Archbishop of Westminster, what would you do to spread Catholicism in England? Oh, I've been asked this question as if I was the Archbishop of Canterbury on previous, but but I think the, I think the answer is the same. Uh it, it, Europe was evangelized by monks and by monasticism. And with the appalling breakdown in family and in community and in existential uh, or integrity, uh, I think one of the most powerful gifts that the church has are monastic and religious communities of, of, of different complexions. I'm not suggesting we should reinvent uh, reinvent the, the Franciscans or the Benedictines. Uh, maybe we have to find an order for the 21st century. But uh, I, I think what I would want to do, I mean, I, I think you know, Opus Dei falls into this. I think I'd want to find communities of committed believers where uh, where people wouldn't have to survive either as members of the nuclear family, which is under dreadful stress, but but could find a Catholic family, a Catholic community to be part of. Uh, so I think I would I would want to reseed England with 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 monastic communities um, of the right kind of flavour uh, again, in so that the places people could go to find beautiful words, beautiful music, reconciled relationships, a depth of prayer, uh, a, 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 a an atmosphere of 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 hope and vision. It's that this ought to happen in the parishes. Um, but I I think that the problem with the parishes are that they they seem to me to be um they don't eat and drink enough together. <laughs> One of the things I found as an Anglican priest was the liturgy was absolutely essential, but almost as important was the opportunity to eat and drink. So as as a as a university chaplain, uh, I, I would go and I, I got funds together to buy lunch. Uh, and when people would come in, they would be invited to a free lunch where they'd sit and eat and drink and talk. And then for two or three hours, people would make friends. They'd meet people they didn't meet. They'd just sit and eat and drink. There were no expectations. There was no money to be paid. It was, if you like, a, a, a sacramental extension of, of the liturgy in, into community. Um, <clears throat> now, that doesn't happen in parishes. It, it, it could happen. So perhaps I should say I'd want two, I'd want two schemes. I'd want to try and turn parishes into into more of an extended family where people could eat, drink, and and uh, uh, find greater sh sort of existential shelter with one another. But I'd also want the, the monastic communities to act as as profoundly set um, families in, in that that the people could could be protected in and take nourishment from in, in the Christian ethos. Yeah, which very much fits in with like the idea of the Benedict option that uh, yeah. Rod Vera talked about, just building these communities that would be strong going forward. Before we end here, how can people find out about your work and, and what you're up to these days? Uh, well, if they, they go to my website, ashenden.org, um, th that's, uh, that's where I, 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 I offer no longer homilies, but catechesis uh, on, on YouTube, but they all it all starts on ashenden.org. Um, and I'm very much hoping to develop this uh, this site in Normandy where people can come and it's got this wonderful chapel in the garden. I discovered that uh, the, I, I bought it. F there's a level of spiritual continuity. I can do this in 30 seconds. I won't take long. I, I, I found this 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 small plot by a river, an old mill with two houses and a chapel. And it turns out it was built by a Catholic philanthropist who lived in Paris, who ran an addiction center. And so he would bring his addicts out of Paris and in, in the garden, he built a huge greenhouse about 50 foot long and a chapel on the end. Uh, and so he got people growing things and saying their prayers. Uh, and I, 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 I found it by accident. And I, I think what I'm hoping to do, the, cha the chapel is inhabited by angels uh, and a great sense of numinousness. And because we're set between St. Michael and this place of apparition of Our Lady in pont uh, I I think one of the things it will do, I hope, is to provide... Uh, a place of retreat and refreshment un under the radar where people can come and say their prayers, learn a bit more of the faith and take a deep breath before they go back into the world. So um, uh, if people on my website will 
uh, keep an eye open for that. I'm, I'm hoping to develop that over the next 10 years. Um, and uh, um, the, the, there we are. The, for as long as I'm not thrown off the internet, that's where I'll be found. Sound, that sounds incredible. I will definitely, I'll link to that site in the show notes so people can easily find it. I really appreciate your time uh, today, taking some time. It, it's been great uh, to find out about all this. And I, I'm a little bit more optimistic than I was. So I think that's a good thing. Uh, hopefully you're right about <laughs> that stuff. So. But thank you. I really do appreciate it. And it's been lovely to talk to you. Thank you for giving me the time and, uh, and the company. Thank you. Okay, until next time, everybody. God love you. <laughs>